Welcome to the podcast, She is Fab, where we discuss all things fab, women empowerment, and life coaching. My name is Evelyn, also known as the Fab Chief Desk, and I am a mindset transformation coach. Today, we are welcoming you back to the stage, Janice Eisman, owner of My Body Couture. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm so excited to be back. We had a great conversation last time, so I'm really excited for our conversation today. Me too. As I mentioned, Janice is owner of My Body Couture. She has a very unique story, you know, being a farm girl, going to uh, New York City, working at Harper's Bazaar, transitioning to then having her own business, all while having a child. So today you want to dive a little bit deeper into some topics pertaining to her story. So first things first, I want to ask is, you know, you have a unique perspective as an entrepreneur because you are a mother. You actually transitioned and your catalyst was having a child. So I want to explore that, how it has been different for you because you're a mother. Whew. Yes, that is, that's a big topic. So I think um, the starting place for this conversation for me is the notion that we're always told that we can't have it all. So what we're told culturally is that you can have it all, just not at one time. And I know that Sheryl Sandberg took a lot of heat for the book Lean In, but that's basically what the message of that book was that we actually tend to lean back on our careers when we think that that is the case. So we tend to not go all in when we think, well, in a couple of years, I might have a child, so I'm going to not put my full effort in because we can have it all, but just not at one time. <laughs> so we tend to actually not throw ourselves into our careers. And I think the other messaging that we often get is as mothers that the child is the number one priority. And so in our last episode, I shared that I was a lone parent, which puts me in a bit of a unique position because I don't share custody with anyone else. And I am the family's sole breadwinner. I don't get child support from anyone else either. So I've had to really fill both roles. And I didn't really think about kind of that idea of you can have it all just not at one time. Prior to having a child, I also didn't really think about the idea that, you know, that as a mother, that I would actually culturally be expected to give up my career and really put my child first. But all of a sudden, these messages started flying at me after I had the child. So in some ways, I was really lucky because I didn't hear a lot of that before I had a child. Part of that was because I was in New York City. Um, part of that was, you know, even my upbringing on a farm. That isn't really the messaging that young women are getting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually feel like I sat in a little bit of a golden bubble where I didn't start hearing that until after, but then what kind of started to happen was I ended up having a lot of guilt and I felt like no matter what I did, it wasn't enough. I couldn't work enough. I couldn't parent enough. I couldn't be enough because all of a sudden I was in this place where, I'm supposed to have this perfect mom body and I'm supposed to have my child looking all cute in little outfits all the time. And I'm supposed to, um, you know, be posting these things on Instagram to show what an amazing mother I am. And I'm supposed to be spending all this time with my child, which I do, but, and I enjoy that, but, um, and looking after that whole piece, but then at the same time, I'm building a business. And so that was a really long answer to say that what I had to do was two things. One really shut out, the things that didn't add anything for me. So one example, my child is 10 now, so he's school aged and first day of school, anybody who's on Instagram or Facebook is going to see hundreds of photos of children with a letter board or a chalkboard beside them posed underneath a tree in a cute outfit with a fresh haircut and new shoes. And the letter board or chalkboard will say, you know, the grade of the child and a couple things the child mm -hmm. likes. And I love taking pictures, but I just, I was like, I really, I don't like letter boards. I don't like crafts. I don't want to do chalkboard things. <laughs> and I was super stressed out because I'm like, I'm lucky if I get a photo of my child when he's not scowling or running because I've taken so many mm -hmm. pictures of this kid over his life. And my girlfriend, Shanna, actually said to me, 
you know, you don't enjoy the crafting piece of mothering. Why are you trying to do it? And that mm -hmm. was a simple thing that she said to me one time that just hit me like a load of bricks. Like, why am I trying to keep up with everything I am told that I'm supposed to be doing? I can just let that piece go. So that was item number one, was just letting go of what I was told that I was supposed to do. And number two was actually just kind of getting ruthless with my time in terms of even with the things I am supposed to do, there is only time to do so much. And so I think that I'm actually a much better time manager than I used to be. And I've always been quite good at it. I'm a high achiever, high accomplisher, but I really have to shave things out in terms of, you know, in order to accomplish all this stuff, there just isn't time for everything. So I have mm -hmm. to pick and choose and make decisions. And so I think that versus before I had children, actually, in some ways, I do more, I accomplish more. And part of that is just letting go of those societal expectations. Part of that is just really getting clear with my time. And I mean, part of what I have lost for sure is a bit of my leisure time, but I just, I don't, I still don't buy into the, you can have everything just not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> you said a lot of good things um, in your answer there. And don't worry, we don't have like a strict time gap for what the answer has to be. But um, you said a lot of good things there. You were already challenged with having a child and, and launching this business. But then you have the added layer where you are a single parent. There is, isn't a person who is right beside you that you can fall back on or who can help with some of those responsibilities. Sure. We know that you, you know, are living in Canada now you have your sister there that can help here and there, but ultimately it's really up to you, um, as the mother on top yes. of that, you have to manage your time well in order to fit in the things that matter. Women are already under so much pressure yeah. to fit into various, you know, buckets, you know, mother, uh, partner, if you know, if, if you have a husband or boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever, what have you, right? Um, what's in the workforce, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, there's a certain uh, image that you have to present. And as a mother, especially, obviously, I'm not a mother, so I can't relate fully. I have a lot of nieces and nephews, though. <laughs> And lots of moms who talk to me about their experience. Uh, but they also talk about those pressures to be a certain type of mom, to engage in a certain way with their child and, and also portray that image to the external. So the yeah. fact that you were able to see that messaging, take it and only use what you really needed and get rid of the rest is great. Yeah. And I think that that applies whether you're a mother or not. In our culture, you're absolutely right. Women are carrying this tremendous burden at all times to do a lot. We are ultimately tasked with most of the invisible labor in our culture, and that is cleaning and it is caretaking. That could be mm -hmm. nieces and nephews. That could be parents. Um, we are often tasked with everything in the domestic realm. So that's cooking, food acquisition, and it's called invisible labor because we don't pay for it. So it's not like, mm -hmm. it's not like husbands are <laughs> compensating wives for doing these things, <laughs> but all kinds of research exists that shows that women are carrying this burden mm -hmm. hours a day more than men are. So much as we've come a long ways in terms of equalizing the workforce, we aren't anywhere close to equalizing the domestic life in terms of it actually being equal. So now what we're seeing is women actually going to work, working as many hours as men and coming home and having a second shift of work where mm -hmm. I believe that it's two and a half hours more per day than men. And that's in a childless environment. So it's up to four hours more a day in a childed environment. That's a lot because mm -hmm. I would personally love to have an extra 28 hours a week of leisure time versus a partner for sure. Yes. Um, and so I think that women are holding this in every area of life, whether you've got a child or not, where we're supposed to, on top of that, have trim bodies and perfect hair and done nails and never have a wrinkle and have <laughs> clothes on, you know? 
Um, so it's just, it's layers and layers that exist at every level, whether you've got a child or not. Yeah, I got an image of a Stepford wife when you said that, you know, it's just like <laughs> yeah. at home waiting with the food and the cake and the makeup and the hair and the dress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think we're actually held to different standards in the office as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, again, there's research that shows that women still are not actually achieving equality in terms of wages. We're not actually achieving full equality in terms of our accessibility to work in certain sectors, especially. So mm -hmm. things like science and technology, et cetera, we're not quite at this equality point. So I think that it, you know, part of this conversation is the value in it is that it actually is a universal experience. Just as a woman, yes. I happen to be telling a story about, you know, a letter board and a tree on the first day of school, but this, this exists no matter what we can, we can be 25, we can be 65, we can have children that are grown, we can have children that are young and living in the house, we can have no children, but we can all relate to these pressures and this expectation that society has set for us to look a certain way, to do a certain set of tasks, and to always be happy and cheerful and positive mm -hmm. and, and providing and multitasking, juggling and doing what needs to be done with a smile on our face. And then post right. it on Instagram. <laughs> I wonder, one of the things that I, that I think about a lot is whether that caregiving attitude or caregiving nature is actually really our nature as women, or if it's something that is bred into us, uh, you know, as yeah. we grow and develop. Because I find myself, I'm very caregiving to the point where it can be a detriment to me sometimes. Um, so I'm always trying to balance uh, the two aspects. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to answer it in the opposite way, because I have always heard that, well, men really have this drive to provide, but I can tell you that that drive is very equally there in women when you are the only provider in the home. So mm -hmm. that does make me question whether there's just this natural nurturing in women. I don't believe that it is there to the extent that, you know, we're born with it and that's just how it is. Because I, I think mm -hmm. that put in a scenario where we are going to be that sole caregiver. I think that men would be every bit as much a caregiver as a woman would, just the same way that I've stepped into prioritizing and being super passionate about my ability to be the family's provider, because I have to be. Mm -hmm. You have no choice, right? You yeah. are the single parent to your 10-year-old child who also has a successful business, right? There's a lot of balancing you have to do there. Yeah, there is. There is. And it's, I actually kind of laugh because I do feel like um, there's a lot of parallels between my child and my business. They're kind of the same age, but they're mm -hmm. both things where you can't just shut the door and sit on the couch and pretend they don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so I think as a business owner, it is kind of like having a child because that responsibility mm -hmm. is always there. And that's what makes parenting a unique to the world item because it is always a responsibility whether the child's asleep whether you're at work mm -hmm. that's still a responsibility and i can't just outsource all of that because it still sits mm -hmm. in my head whether, whether somebody else would help me with that or not <laughs> but my business is actually the same where you know this is being recorded on a friday night but mm -hmm. my work day isn't over in terms of i'm not just like okay fold it up and we don't think about that till monday that doesn't exist. Right. I definitely understand now a bit more having my own business and, you know, talking to other folks who have their own business, the amount of time that you spend trying to grow and expand or just do the daily tasks that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, prior to having a business, I would, when I worked for, you know, mostly corporate, I would see the CEO or these, you know, high ranking executives constantly busy going back and forth, just doing so much. And I couldn't, grasp the idea but now i'm just like okay this is this makes sense and yeah. it wasn't even their business it's they're working for a corporation that's right yeah and i think that that sense of responsibility and accountability is really what what carries you forward and makes it different than a corporate job where you take your salary and then you take your vacation days and you have mm -hmm. your set work hours 
that accountability and responsibility kind of is woven through multiple elements of my life where that exists, whether I'm actually tasking that piece of my life or I'm not mm-hmm. tasking that piece of my life. Because ultimately, I mean, I can go out for a walk and leave my child, but if something happens, that's my responsibility and I'm accountable mm-hmm. for it. Yeah. And the same thing with my business. So even when that door is shut in my in my commercial space, I'm responsible for it. If somebody breaks in, I'm responsible for it. I'm responsible for paying that rent, whether I use the space or not. So 24 seven, there is that sense of responsibility and accountability. Right. So talking about the commercial space, you know, COVID has changed how a lot of us work and how we interact and engage you having a brick and mortar business, you know, before COVID and now here in COVID, what are the challenges that you've experienced? How have you shifted to a different model so you can continue to grow and expand your business? Yeah, I was kind of lucky actually, because most of us have some sense of familiarity with the concept that the first five years of opening and running a business is that critical phase. And I don't know exactly what the statistics are, but a lot of businesses actually don't make it past five years. So there's a there's a heavy drop off in that first five years of people mm-hmm. that open businesses and then don't continue them. And I, I mean, having a commercial space is extremely expensive in terms of <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really matter how you cut it. There in those first couple of years, every time you turn around, there is another expenditure, and half of it was unplanned. <laughs> um, but where money comes in, and then it goes out to buy a sign, and money comes in, and it goes out to buy business cards, and money comes in, and it goes out to buy a business license, and money comes in, and it goes out to buy brochures, and money comes in, and it goes out to buy a marketing tool, money comes in, and it goes out to buy a chair, et cetera, et cetera. And it just felt, you know, there's always kind of whenever I would get something that would to other people feel like income out, it would go for expenditure on the business. And most business owners will tell you that on some level. And it Mm -hmm. does tend to stabilize and equalize after a while. I mean, there's still fixed costs, obviously, but a lot of those startup costs are really heavy on that front end. So when I got to that five year point, I was like burned out. I was not really making any money. And when I say not really, I mean, I was, I was in red because I mean, part of it was actually that I had a small child. So there, those were the heavy up years of childcare expenses, et cetera. And he needed a babysitter if I was going to leave him unattended period. It wasn't a choice as it, as it is now, he can stay at home for some short unsupervised times. Those days we're not those days. Um, And so the combination of the most expensive period of a child and the most expensive period of my business meant that there actually wasn't any money left for me. And so I was working really, really hard. And yes, it was definitely a job I enjoyed, but the, the set of numbers didn't match in a way that looked like an income. The set of numbers, Mm -hmm was running red at a certain point. And so I remember sitting in my living room and I invited a friend over and I burst into tears because I was basically sitting on the lease rewrite period. So we were right at that five-year point. And I looked at my friend and I was like, I see why businesses don't last longer than five years. The business owner quits. (laughs) And, you know, I owe my friend a huge debt of gratitude because she calmly went to my son's bedroom and pulled out a piece of blue paper and got a yellow marker and we drew a line down the middle of the paper and she was like okay so if you were to quit let's talk about what you could do so in the last podcast I talked about how I had you know I had changed careers I changed cities I changed countries so Mm -hmm. we were really looking at a sheet where I was going to have to start fresh because I used to work in the media I don't live in a media heavy city Plus I'd been out for five years, but I didn't have a contact sheet, a contact list here. So we had a really tiny, sad list (laughs) of the things I could do. (laughs) Um, But then we started brainstorming of what I could do with my existing business if I was Mm -hmm. to remove the lease. And 
I'm going to be honest. I have no idea if I actually executed a single thing from my little tear stained blue piece of paper with the yellow marker on it. But oh. what really emerged from that was a whole page full of ideas, a whole mm -hmm. page. And so what stands out in my mind from a couple of years ago was we had a short list of other things in this world that I could do. And we had a long list of ways that I could change and amend my business. Mm -hmm. So all that is to say that in 2018, I actually started down a road of executing either identical things to what was on that paper or slightly different ones. I'm not sure, but I started to actually change my business. So I became a product distributor. I uh, actually became a teacher trainer in one of my techniques. I started writing and generating income doing that. I started some digital projects. So fortunately for me, two years prior to COVID, I actually was already online. Um, and so what really happened was that I then had five income streams and when COVID, when the wave of COVID came over us, I already had two full years of digital experience. So I had clients online in three hours. Mm -hmm. And I also had four other income streams. And so it, it wasn't easy by any means, but I was able to sort of like a DJ deck, I could just amp one piece up and one piece down. So obviously I don't need to say this, but my in-person studio business went to zero, but then I could take that online piece and move it up. And I, and product sales have actually gone up. So every time there's closures, those product sales go up and the, um, the one-to-one -one services go down. So mm -hmm. I actually was two years out of the gate on all of these ideas, which I am so grateful for because to actually come up with those ideas and start with them from scratch at a moment that was already so harried and confused, confusing and confused um, would have actually just been a task probably bigger than I could have taken on in a meaningful way. But mm -hmm. so many people have asked me, well, what's next? What projects are you launching? I'm like, I already launched these projects, all of them two years ago. They're like little <laughs> toddlers running around. But I haven't actually changed my business strategy even a smidge since COVID started. Mm -hmm. I just have, um, you know, changed up my marketing a little bit, but that's about it. So that's amazing. You're luckier than most folks because a lot of folks have really had to scramble to change their whole uh, dynamic and how they operate their business. Uh, and also necessity breeds action. So you have this moment where you were considering, you know, what else you could do because you were worried about your business. And then you have the support system that stepped in to help you to kind of brainstorm that. So that's awesome. One that you had that support system and two that you were able to see all these positive aspects and things that you could do to continue and maintain your business. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest lessons I've gotten out of that, even though it sounds completely crazy and it sounds super counterintuitive and as a business owner, you're already feel like you're drowning in all this work, but is to actually have more than one way to actually generate a little bit of income. And some mm -hmm. of the, some of the items that I just listed off aren't, you know, I couldn't live on my writing income that would not work, but it is a supplement and it is something that I can do more of if I need to, or if I have time to, et cetera. And so I think I really did learn the importance of having more than one way to earn an income. And I think that, you know, I don't need to say it, but in COVID, we've actually definitely seen the impact of that exposure to something that even, you know, look at a restaurant, like that's, that seemed like a guaranteed kind of income stream. You get customers, yes. that's what happens. And then all of a sudden, this completely crazy worst case scenario where you're not governmentally allowed to even be open comes over you to always have those backup plans and always have those contingency plans for other ways that you can generate income. So important because it actually kept me from panicking. Mm -hmm. I actually was, I had a lot of work to do and I had a lot of, um, effort to exert, but I didn't panic and I didn't shut down and I didn't have to close my business and I didn't have to terminate my lease. So I think that, you know, I accidentally hardship in the past 
led to this amazing preparation in a lot of ways for what was about to come. And I, you know, I can't even understate how important that is to actually have that little bit of diversity so that you're not completely exposed to one situation, which, you know, if I was, I, honestly, if the only way that I could have made money was in-person clients in my mm -hmm. studio space, I would be out of business and bankrupt right now. Yeah, that's a, a good point that you make too. I think now with, you know, now with a year, a year in COVID, <laughs> um, yeah. a lot of folks have had to think about, you know, again, shifting how they conduct their business, but what their revenue streams are, right? A lot of folks yeah. just focus on one revenue stream. Um, so you were ahead of the curve because you had more than the one you already had experience with digital services. Um, but this year has really brought into focus to uh, other business owners out there or folks that are trying to launch a business, the fact that they need to have uh, other sources of yeah. revenue. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that we often don't really ever talk about as business owners is how long these things take. So I've, like a lot of other businesses this year, I've been hit with a lot of marketing from business coaches on, you know, develop your course, develop your program, develop your residual income stream. It takes years to actually get to a place where it's a steady, consistent income stream. And so that matters a lot too, because mm -hmm. we can't just, you know, I would say I'm in year two and a half of a lot of these projects and some of them are just starting to kind of turn into something that looks a little bit more mature that I can kind of count on. I shouldn't ever say that, but <laughs> that I understand sort of what the revenue stream looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at year two and a half. So we don't want to put ourselves in the position where something goes sideways and then we're trying to develop this residual income that we need it to generate income two months from now, because I actually do talk about my little business units like children where, you know, if it takes five years for that first, it took five years for that first bricks and mortar business to feel anything like stable. And I would actually say it was like eight for it to actually kind of fully settle. And that's kind mm -hmm. of like a kid. So, you know, now I've got these two and a half year olds running around and it's still chaotic, you know, like if you watch a two and a half year old, they make messes. They, they do things when they're left unattended, they don't do anything that's particularly linear. And so Technology. We, right, exactly. <laughs> so if we think about our businesses, like kids, it takes just about as long, you know, after 10 years, you can leave the business unsupervised for a little bit and it's probably fine. But if it's a year old, probably not fine. So I think that we have to keep that in mind too. Residual mm -hmm. income projects take a lot of time to develop, but they also take time to oversee. You can't just do a residual income product, slap it up on the internet and become a millionaire. That's a one and that's a lottery ticket story. And it does happen, <laughs> but for the most part, it takes tending, it takes sales, it takes attention, it takes time. And it isn't just something where you turn profit and have that profit be completely understood. So mm -hmm. I think that for, you know, if there was one piece of advice I would give, it would be, you have to be slow, steady, consistent, and you have to raise that business unit, which takes time and years. You heard it here, guys. Listen to Janice. If you <laughs> haven't heard it before, which I doubt you haven't, slow and steady wins the race. Obviously, there are stories out there where someone will get lucky and blow up overnight. That is the exception, not the rule. You have to work and it takes time. So patience is a virtue you want to develop and continue to develop as you build your business and varied revenue streams. Great advice, Janice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so from square one to where you are today, I'm sure you've had uh, some forms of setbacks or maybe some epic failures. Uh, let's hear about that and how you kind of got through it. Um, I mean, one of my biggest setbacks was actually when I had a personal burnout. Um, so just between parenting and trying to, 
you know, start a business from scratch and doing that without a ton of support on any, in any area, I literally worked myself into a stupor into the ground. Um, and so where that put me personally was a place where, I mean, there's a, there's a little chunk of time. I really can't extract good, clear, full memories of, um, because I was personally burned out. And so that's a huge setback in terms of nothing really happened from the outside. It was happening from the inside where I just didn't have the energy to run my business. And I remember being in my studio and a client telling me that she had burned out and took five years to recover. And I was like, (laughs) and it was actually, it's pretty close to that. So I think that, um, you know, I would, I would recommend that you pace yourself and you watch yourself and you chunk your work in a way that's sustainable because I lost more time by trying to work that hard and that much than I would have if I just did 25% less, but had been able to sustain the pace for through those years when I was actually burned out. Mm -hmm. One of the common things that um, comes up when talking to other entrepreneurs or business owners uh, is burnout, as well as, you know, the quality of your time. What do you actually dedicate time and space to versus what do you outsource? Um, I know in the last podcast, you mentioned you still do a lot of it yourself, but do you outsource any of the load to anyone else? You get any help in your business? Actually, that's a really interesting question. So what I have chosen to outsource is support for me as a human being. (laughs) So I have a nutrition, actually, you know what? I have two nutrition certifications. I have the education and technically the capacity to cook. And I actually used to love cooking, but it, it totally falls by the wayside. It's just something I actually, I hate grocery shopping. I hate grocery shopping. So if the grocery fairies would just come into my house, it would actually help, but they don't. So that's one thing I outsource. Um, and that these days is super duper easy because we can just go online and have, direct delivery to the door. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also personally outsource my own food. So there is a company where I live um, called Yummy Yogis. And I'm a vegetarian and she makes pre-made vegetarian meals that are super duper healthy and clean and ultra yummy. And I literally drive to her house and pick up three days worth of food. And then I have to cook for my son, but you know, he's 10. So, and, and, and he has learned how to order his own groceries. So this is good. Um, so I actually, I outsource that, um, and I outsource other supports for me. So cleaning, Mm -hmm. I also am not like a superstar cleaner, um, And so I actually keep a lot of the business tasks, but outsource personal supports for me that help me actually keep the car on the road. So where I am healthy and sleeping well and eating well. And um, so I, I often have almost like a little staff of health professionals, whether it's, it's varied over the years, but um, massage therapists or chiropractors or life coaches or people like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And all of that is actually really dedicated to the whole ship sinks if I sink. And so that's actually a backwards approach for most business owners. Most business owners actually outsource business tasks. I outsource Mm -hmm. personal tasks. Yeah. I think that's uh, a very unique and awesome perspective, actually, because I haven't thought of of the personal things that we do, right? The things that take up time in our daily lives, like grocery shopping or like cooking. Like you said, most folks focus on outsourcing things to do with their business. But here we have two models, right? Your model is one and this one is, is the common, the normal model, right? Yeah. Your model is it actually makes sense, right? If you're going to manage your business, if you want to have more of a hand in the day-to-day operations, then it would make sense that you would then outsource uh, things in your daily life, in your personal life, 
that will help yeah. you to be a better CEO or owner of your business. So that's, that's right. That's great. <laughs> And it's really looking at that whole task list because no matter what, I'm responsible for all of it. And then yes. trying to figure out those higher mileage items. And so partly because I did have that personal burnout um, and partly because I work in the health industry, I'm patently aware of the idea that you know healthy eating is going to actually give me more mileage to outsource than, I don't know, someone sweeping the floor in my studio because I have the energy to sweep the floor if I have that good quality, healthy food versus if I'm eating whatever it is that I eat when I'm left unsupervised. <laughs> and again, I have the knowledge. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of overall resources. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean time to get it all done. So right. I think that what we need to do is look at it all and then just pick the ones that we feel are going to give us the highest mileage for right. those outsourcing dollars. Because one of the things I did realize a long time ago, we can outsource the crap out of everything in our business and basically go bankrupt doing it. It's <laughs> because, a lot of expenditure, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge expenditure. And so we really have to look at where those dollars are going and make sure that they're directly feeding back into a system, not just, I don't want to do this task. Let's get someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about your model, I'm, I'm calling it your model, <laughs> is that it's not just activities that consume your time. It's also self-care. You mentioned, you yeah. know, you have your, your life coach, there's nutrition in there. So it's not just the external stuff. You're also working on you and the internal, which is that's great. Right. So in terms of um, your nightly thoughts, <laughs> is there anything right now that kind of keeps you up at night, whether it's, you know, your business or even the care with your son as a mom who is a business owner? <sighs> I'm always sort of feeling like there's never enough hours in the day um, because no matter what, there aren't. <laughs> Yeah. So I try to keep, I try to keep everything at almost a minimum standard. A long time ago, I get, I, I've often had advice by coaches to use kind of a grid system, put the urgent important things in one corner and the urgent not important things in the other corner and, you know, the, those four corners. Yeah. And I, and I, it doesn't work because I have more urgent important things then I have time to do. So what I really try to do so that I can sleep at night is do just enough, mm -hmm. just good enough so that everything is actually operational, functional, and working. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I definitely was a perfectionist. I remember in my twenties going to a therapist and she was like, mm, you're a perfectionist. I'm like, yes. She's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and let me tell you the experience of being a single parent business owner has driven that out of town because I, I can't be a perfectionist. So I've really adopted the good enough is good enough model where as long as something is getting done that's keeping it all afloat i can sleep yes. at night it's it's when there starts to be big gaps in the system um and so i'm not perfect about deadlines i'm not perfect about getting all those urgent important things done um because as soon as i start to list those there's things that just aren't done <laughs> Um, yes, a perfectionism but, is a is a really bad thing for for the majority of folks. I mean, anyone who's high achieving like yourself or has aspirations tends to be a perfectionist or have some form of uh, perfectionism. But that kind of puts you into analysis paralysis, right? If you're trying to perfect every single thing, you actually start to diminish your momentum of moving forward. So yeah. that's a good thing that you address that uh, in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And what I have done is two things. One is breaking down big things into little steps. And so as long as I'm taking a little step, I'm good. So it doesn't even matter what it is. I just, from the day I started that business, take one step, send one email, 
send one text and that can be all you do on that whole project for the full day but there's momentum mm -hmm. there especially if you're kind of tossing that momentum to someone else um and then you know like i'm not the most organized person but i i action things so that's the second mm -hmm. thing is instead of spending all the time planning and organizing and making things tidy and having it all structured i just do and <laughs> it it leads to some back backer messes which some people find really funny but you know like that the actual actions are taken and the actual mm -hmm. um the the check marks are done and so even though it's not done cleanly and tidily and with structure and regiment you know i mm -hmm. opened a business without a business plan um yeah so in fairness it was my second business but in the first business actually failed because i spent too too much time writing out the business plan and making it perfect and there wasn't enough action. So this time I've done it the opposite way. And a lot of the things that are kind of messy and unstructured are things that no one else ever sees. Mm -hmm. So that's a good share right there. I hope you guys are listening in and really take that into consideration. Everybody does things their own way. There is no straightforward path. There is no set in stone method to go about achieving your results. You have to find what works for you. Yeah. And I think just really not getting stuck in that, like you said, analysis paralysis. And for me, it's taking the action that counts, not planning the action. It is mm -hmm. actually taking a step that is progressive and checking something off the list. And I don't think that everybody has the fortitude to hold that because it would really bother some people to actually have disorganization or to have things that are not perfectly structured. But for mm -hmm. me, that is actually what has kept it all going. It's the fact that I'm taking consistent action and not worrying about the other half of it. And that's what matters, right? You have a goal or end result, but if you don't take any action towards that, I mean, what are you doing, right? You're not going to get there. So really you can plan all you want, but unless the action is there, you're going nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually because of that, I have a really strong resilience to failure. So I'm going to use podcasts as an example. So I mm -hmm. have guested 108 podcasts, which is works wow. out to an average about four a week. But behind the scenes, I apply for a lot more than four podcasts a week. And I don't know, a solid chunk of them never reply to me. A solid chunk reply and then things just sort of fall through the cracks. And that's just a small example, but, you know, I would say probably it's, it would probably I apply for five podcasts to every one that actually works out. Mm -hmm. And so that means that I'm actually failing more than I'm succeeding, but this is true in absolutely every area of business. And I think the more you practice failure, the more resilient you are to it. To be quite frank with you, I don't even notice the podcast failures because I'm doing this in all areas. So I'm doing it with writing. I'm doing it with client marketing in all kinds of areas. I'm doing it all over the place. And I will put myself out there in ways that I'm like, I don't know what's about to happen. I once wanted to speak at a fitness conference. That was kind of like a big goal of mine. And I just tossed in an application. I think to be quite frank with you, I probably spent 10 or 15 minutes on the application. I did not spend a lot of time doing it and I actually got to do it. Um, had I failed at that, I wouldn't have actually sat in, in, in the failure. I just would have mm -hmm. been like, oh, oh, well, I only spent 10 minutes <laughs> doing it, what do you think? <laughs> um, but I think that that's actually a super, super, super critically important piece of being successful is to have a super high resilience tolerance for failure to the point where every single day you're doing 
multiple things that actually don't work out because what it gives you, I have no sense of being nervous. I have no sense of actually, frankly, paying a lot of attention to these things. I have no sense of holding energy around the idea of, okay, this is my big shot. Um, I just Mm. keep going because my goal is to record three to five podcasts per week. And Mm -hmm. that's actually what matters. It's not the idea that I have to actually apply to all these other ones. It, that's just part of the process of, of getting it done. Mm-hmm. I'm so happy you shared that, that you're so candid with, you know, your application process and how many out of however many you get, <laughs> because a lot of us tend to focus again on the best things, the positive things, the yeses. Yeah. Uh, and those no's, yeah, they may hurt or sting the ego somewhat. And your failures, you know, can also hurt and make you feel a certain type of a way. But I fully believe, and this is something I preach with my clients, is that failure is important. Yeah. Failure is a chance to learn. It's a chance to adapt and redo it or come and approach it from a different perspective. So it's not a negative in my book. It's also though something that we just need to actually get some awareness about what it takes. So I think that if I actually was like, oh, I want it, you know, again, I'm going to use podcasts, but if I wanted to actually get on a podcast and I uh, applied for four and didn't get any of them, I wouldn't realize that maybe it's that fifth one that I was going to get. But because now I've applied for, you know, hundreds of them and I've gotten a hundred, I actually have some pretty good math where I know at this point approximately what that's going to look like in terms of I have to apply for X number to get X number and it's going to take this long to do those applications. But you actually, that so I know that that's what it looks like. And then I don't even see it as failure. It's just part of the process. And that's what it looks like. And then I, from there, I can decide whether that's worth that time to me or worth that effort to me. But I think that unless we're put in that position where we can either gather, where we can even gather that data, we might see mm-hmm. it as failure. We might look at that and be like, well, I wanted to do podcasts and I applied for four and I didn't get any of them. That's a good approach. Actually quantifying the effort and what you're trying to accomplish is important. If if you guys out there aren't tracking all of this expenditure and effort in what you're trying to achieve, you're actually doing yourself a disservice because how do you know you're growing and progressing, right? If you're not actually tracking this data and having it work for you. That's right. Great. And then I think, I think it allows you to sharpen that pencil I have learned things that work better and work less effectively. And it's only by getting that experience under my belt, because this is a marketing tool that I wanted to actually engage in. Mm -hmm. But I had to get through a hundred of them in order to sharpen it a little bit. I can't do that the first time. I can't actually get enough data underneath me to know. So I think that we don't, actually talk enough about failure and failure resilience because we do look at that word failure and we think negative but it's actually a huge positive because i think you cannot run a business without that failure resilience tolerance it just it, mm-hmm. because you'll sit and marinate and you won't be able to sleep at night because you'll be stuck in that idea of failure Right. Well, similar to how you as an individual are a product of your experiences, your upbringing, the mistakes and successes, you know, along your path, it's the same with your business, right? Anything that you do in the course of setting it up, implementing, growing and expanding uh, applies to how your business comes about, how it's built and how you interact and move within that world, right? So failures are equally as important as your successes. They are. In fact, I think they're more important. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I I agree. Because if if you're always succeeding, if everything's always going well for you, you're actually not growing, not developing, and you're missing out on some lessons that could actually make you greater. Failure makes it so that you don't attach yourself to something needing to happen because it has Mm -hmm. always happened. So I have launched myself at some of the most ridiculous things ever because I don't care. You know, I'm like, I actually know I can handle 
the idea mm-hmm. of this not working out, it would be cool if it did. And that's what has allowed me to launch myself at these things where if I stopped and I started to get into my head, I would actually get imposter syndrome about it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned attachment. This is something that I don't get to talk to uh, folks a lot about, but developing attachment to either a person, an idea, a behavior, a belief, uh, it can be detrimental to you, right? So in this case, we're talking about being attached to an outcome, right? So you're like, oh, I want to get these four podcasts. I'm attached to making sure that I get them. And then I don't, I'm going to feel uh, a certain way. So yes. attachment is another thing that that I talk about with my client, right? Is making sure, yes, it's okay to have goals. It's okay to aim for certain results. But when you develop an unhealthy attachment, that actually sabotages the progress that you could make. So I relate to you in the sense that I will apply or go for things that could be deemed outlandish or maybe outside of my purview in terms of where I am in life. But I'm like, you know what? If it happens, great. If it doesn't, next time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, And I think that no matter what, if you are consistent and you are putting yourself out there for opportunities, you are going to get some of them, even if they are completely crazy. And that's Mm -hmm. how people get these crazy outlandish opportunities because they actually try. People end up on TV shows because they tried, not because it Mm -hmm. landed in their lap. People end up in all kinds of scenarios. I mean, you name an opportunity and they end up there because they actually took that risk to get there. And a lot of times that was without that attachment that this was everything and everything in their life rested on it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I love that. I'm all about that. I tell folks go for it. If there's something that you want to do, you have to at least try, right? Whether you get the result that you want or not, trying is the first step. And if for some reason it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean it won't in the future. That's right. That's right. Or something similar or something Or it leaves space for something that you never knew was about to happen. That happens too, right? You go after one thing and that thing isn't meant for you at this time, but another door opens that actually fits and aligns better with where you are. Exactly. So I'm also curious uh, in regards to your son, does your son ever talk to you or express interest in your business? Does he ever offer any opinions on like the podcast that you do or how you market yourself? He does only 10, but he's probably a really smart 10 year old. <laughs> he doesn't, but it is funny because I've realized during COVID how much of it he actually takes in um, because I was actually doing a podcast in December. And when I was done the podcast, he pitched the idea to this gentleman of doing a podcast with him. And he knew how to actually position it and he knew how to close the deal. And it was really adorable to watch actually. So although he's not actually offering direct one-to-one opinions, he is, you know, he's at home with me right now as I'm doing all this. He has spent a ton of time in the studio and it's all just kind of soaked in him. And Mm -hmm. sometimes I just stand back and I'm like, oh yeah, you're, you're (laughs) actually really absorbing all of this, even if it doesn't seem like it. That is great. And I'm sure it'll, it'll benefit him as it already has, right? He has a podcast collaboration. I wasn't doing podcasts when I was 10, let me tell you. (laughs) I will say uh, the younger generation, it doesn't matter what age, just younger period are way ahead than like where I was at that age. (laughs) Totally. Yes, I completely agree. (laughs) So we touched earlier on the metrics and uh, you're working with life coaches and their suggestion on using certain diagrams to plan around certain things. So I want to elaborate a little bit more. How do you balance your personal life versus your work life? Oh, the work life balance question. Um, I don't think there is one in terms of... It's not a it's not a line down the center of the paper where we have work and we have life. What I actually netted out with, and this is something that's a bit newer, but I take I write out my to-do lists and they're written um, in marker, smelly marker. <laughs> um, 
And I actually started on my to-do list. I used to just put my business tasks and sometimes mix in my personal tasks. And now I divide it into four. And on the left side of that list is actually personal items of, you know, I call it my left side list that helps sustain me. So I'll have things like bath, listen to a podcast, read a book, call a friend, take a walk, stuff like that. And then every day I actually make sure that I look on that menu and do a couple of them. So some days I do more, some days I do less. And I don't kind of track what's what, because as a business owner and as a parent, I don't kind of shut the lights off at five, then spend an hour with my son and have time to myself. It's all just sort of this fluid mix. And I'm often working at night. Sometimes I don't work till late in the morning, et cetera. So my time is a little bit unstructured. And so I just landed at, let's create this left side list. Let's make sure I'm doing something from this every day. And then I'm kind of a sustainable container. And the days when I have time to do more, I do more. The days I have time to do less, well, you know, maybe maybe all I'm doing is going for a walk and listening to a podcast, or maybe I'm all I'm doing is having a super quick bath. But we're getting something in there so that it's mm -hmm. it's that's how I balance. Yeah, all you can do is your best, really, uh, as a business owner and talking to other business owners like yourself. Uh, the work-life balance is actually sort of a myth. <laughs> they myth. tend to blend in together. And you just build in the time that you can build in for yeah. personal care. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it's it's a huge myth that I think um, I would like to die because it it makes it seem like a they're completely separate and mm -hmm. none of us work that way. We still bring our emotions to work. We still bring elements from our personal life to work. Uh, there's research that shows that the average person actually is doing personal tasking at work. And then same thing, like now we have our phones. So our phones are bleeding into our homes, whether we're entrepreneurs or not. Mm -hmm. um, we don't kind of shut that office door and then the boss can't reach us. So this idea that there are these two completely separate things is such a huge myth. And I hate that phrase, actually. I understand that people use it, but I just think, you know, that word balance isn't accurate because we also have seasons of our life when we're going to work more. or We have seasons of our life where we're going to have more things in the home. And so it's more like work-life sustainability to me than balance. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I like that. Work-life sustainability. I'm going to use that. <laughs> so Janice, before I let you go, is there any final thoughts you want to share with our audience? Um, I think that women only make up about 38% of entrepreneurs. And that is up from around 11%. 30 to 40 years ago. So we're making progress in terms of being our own bosses. I know. But women make up more than 38% of the population. So there's still room to grow. And I think this idea that it's really hard to be an entrepreneur and a mother is that's scary for a lot of people and it's quite pervasive. So I think that you know, I hope that someone here has heard a message that can help them feel a little bit more confident and capable in doing both. Because I think that actually in a lot of ways, there's no better job for a mother in terms of flexibility and in terms of raising a child that is really part of the whole. And so whether you're already a mother or whether that's something that is going to happen in years to come or whether that will never come for you but you actually generate a greater understanding of other female entrepreneurs who might want to have children or currently do i think that we owe it to ourselves and to society to actually have that conversation where we can learn how to do both and get that number looking closer to 50-50 as opposed to 60 or 70-30, 60-40, 70-30. Yes. You heard it here on She Is Fab. Ladies, let's do the work. If they can do it, we can do it too. Yes. Don't let any stigma out there prevent you 
from pursuing what you want to pursue and getting to where you want to be in life. And don't give in to societal norms. Come on, we're trying to break that glass ceiling. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Thank you so much, Janice. As usual, it was a pleasure. Obviously, I like to keep you for longer, but let's face it, you have stuff to get to. I have stuff to get to. So I'm grateful you took the time out to join me again today. Thank you so much for having me again. You're welcome. And of course, we'll talk again soon. This yes, we will. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us on this episode. Again, as I always say, preparation, accountability, execution, and resolve are keys to your success. Until next time.